So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God, as we take some time to, uh, uh, we we ask you to teach us how to pray, as your apostles taught, uh, asked you to teach them, and uh, as uh, people continue to ask the church to teach them how to pray, so that they may draw closer to you, and that uh, they may uh, indeed uh, um, come to know you more and more. So. Uh, we ask you today to help uh, us in this presentation to uh, uh, to truly uh, uh, approach prayer with a uh, with a with a desire to hear you and to uh, and to be attentive to you and to respond to Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, last time I spoke about prayer in general and how. Uh, at times, it is a struggle that we struggle with God. Uh, none of us are on the same page as God all the time. And uh, mm -hmm. so things happen in our life that we don't understand. Things happen to our life that we have a hard time accepting. Things happen in our life where uh, God may not have caused it, but God, in a sense, uh, in a sense, will use it in a way uh, to teach us and to strengthen us and to uh, to help us. So. Um, it's not always that God is the cause of everything, um, you know, but uh, because some of the things are are evil and God doesn't cause evil, and yet God can use everything to his purposes. And so we, we struggle with him, we try to understand him, and uh, uh, that, is, that is a component of prayer uh, that we find ourselves in, and uh, hopefully that was helpful this time. I said we're going to be uh, looking at meditation, and uh, really there are, I guess, um, three things we can meditate on. I mean, there's many things we can meditate on. One is scripture, but the other is uh, meditation on life, and I'm going to look at that. The third is meditation on the life of the saints, and some say you can meditate on art or nature, and that's true too. And uh, so you can really meditate on anything. Uh, but the most common things and the, the things we're drawn to, especially as Christians, is to meditate on scripture and on one's own life um, uh, and, and seeing where God uh, may be speaking to us in these, uh, uh, in these things. Um, there are many ways of meditating. Uh, uh, the two more popular ways and the two that I'm going to talk about is what is called Lectio Divina, which is a, a Benedictine uh, way. It was introduced uh, way back in our tradition and uh, what I would call the Ignatian way. And uh, so we're gonna talk about both of them. Uh, I tend to blend them a little bit in my prayer life. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, I, don't, I don't practice them in any kind of pure form. It's however the spirit moves me. Uh, but I will introduce both methods to you so that um, you may have a, a kind of an understanding of uh, how to begin. Uh, if you have already begun uh, and are well on your way, how maybe to uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe a pointer or two, who knows. Um, and uh, it's best, uh, since it is a meditation on a, on a, on a passage in scripture, I'm going to use two scripture passages. The one I'm going to use for now with Lectio Divina, um, it, it, the word simply is 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 to uh, divine reading. It's like we read the uh, the Bible, the the passage that we have set out to reflect on, and um, we, uh, uh, we 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 basically uh, are open for God to kind of speak to us through a word a phrase, an image, um, whatever it may be, uh, something that kind of sticks with us, something that, in a sense, all of a sudden resonates with us. And, uh, and then we're supposed to sit with it and then read the passage again. And uh, the same word may again resonate, or there might be something else that, in a sense, twins with that word, or that might kind of deepen our understanding that so the thing is, and usually you do that three times. Now, it, it like should look divina can be done individually, and it can be done in group, you know, uh, so that uh, you know, and 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 I've seen it most effective in group settings <coughs> because um, 
basically the passage is read and then everyone shares what is the word and just simply you go around the circle and each person shares a word now for some people for a particular passage nothing speaks it's not a matter of panicking saying well nothing speaks whatever that happens it happens within any prayer situation when you are meditating sometimes in a sense uh, either because uh, you're, you're unable to <coughs> fully enter the passage or somehow nothing really seems to speak then it's just simply to be silent okay. so it's not a matter of panicking it's not a matter of in a sense coming up with something desperately because everyone else has and somehow you know you feel left out uh, there has to be that opportunity for a person to simply say, you know what, uh, and, and, and that also tells us that scripture at times, um, you know, uh, some passages speak to us readily, and some pass passages take time. Uh, I know when I prepare, for example, for the Sunday readings, uh, for the homily, uh, you know, on Mondays when I first approach the passages, even though I preached on them now, uh, several times during my priesthood, every third year they come up, and some readings come up every year. Like for example, at uh, uh, you know at Easter or uh, the second Sunday of Easter, it's always the same read. So, uh, but I always uh, I, I find on a regular basis on Monday I'm going, like, I'm not quite sure what is actually sticking out, and I'm not quite even sure what I'm going to speak about. Maybe be later in the week that the passage kind of uh, kind of opens up for me. So, um, like I say, uh, it is a matter of sometimes sticking with the material and uh, that uh, it requires a certain amount of patience and openness. So, uh, uh, just to illustrate how Lectio Divina works, like I say, it is a matter of reading the passage and then it's a matter of, uh, in a sense, what, what stuck up? What is the word or what is the phrase? Or, What's the image? Uh, what is it that was meaningful to you? So the, the passage I've chosen is uh, uh, the parable of the sower. Uh, it's uh, the most common parable because it's the only parable found in all three gospels. So it is the most common parable. And it also shows up the most in the liturgy because it shows up in all three gospels. Mark, Matthew, Luke, the only one that is in all three. So parable of the sower. And I'll, I'll read the introduction as well, and uh, I may even ask you, uh, we'll have a quiet guitar, <laughs> and uh, if there is a word or a phrase that sticks out for you, please share. If not, you don't have to share. So here's the passage. Again, he began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, <clears throat> since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. <clears throat> Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Okay, 
What do you mean one? Is there a, any word that stuck, stuck, struck you or any image or any phrase? Listen. <laughs> I almost wonder why I got on the phone. <laughs> because the crowds were so large. But like, okay, so now you've got to deal with the waves and the clouds get in the boat. You know, then the coast mom one. The part of the we're on. And you're in the boat. Now what do you do? Okay, the waves are coming. You stay short, you throw the egg. Like, so all these people can take care of you. You know? If we stayed on the land, maybe they couldn't hear them as well. Maybe they could see better. Maybe they don't crowd them. Mm. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Yeah. But I was wondering, what do you think? Why did they get in the boat? I mean, when the picture of the boat is, uh, the picture of the white car and the other picture of the boat, the rest of the movie. I know. Leave it to me. My mother would agree with me. It's just me. Well, it's like the way we feel, the way we want to picture the animal. Well, he's in the boat and it's waving. Now that the apostles come, they stay on the shore, so now he's like happy and tap out. No. Hmm. It's hard for me to meditate because this is the clouds that come up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Jordan. I said, listen. And I just said to her, did you still steal my thought? I had this in my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> things that I have sometimes trouble with. They listen to the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one to go with me sometimes. Listen, listen, listen. It may not always be audible either. It might be completely new senses, I suppose, but listen. It's a, it's a big one for me. Yeah, and, and God may be leading you to what are the obstacles for you to listen, you know? Right. Yours might be that you get, you know, you, you know, uh, your, 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 your mind gets, you know, gets moving on other things. And, uh, and, and let's mm -hmm. face it, that's how it is with other people. So listen, it could, could, you know, uh, uh, maybe a difficult thing, as you, you're saying. So, uh, you know, um, and sometimes it takes all of our effort to simply to listen. So that's just focusing on that one word, you know. So, because uh, um, uh, let's face it, we're all distracted. <laughs> our lives are such that we have a hard time just simply concentrating. Right, because you get caught up in it. Yeah. So you play that in your mind and you take it away from the time you have set aside. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe God's at work at that as well. Who knows? But anyway, anything else that struck you? Choked it. Choked it. Yeah. The idea of, you know, that which grew got choked. It's a strong word. It's a very strong word that choked it. And you can sit with that word. I pictured it too, but I pictured it. And when you count, you are. Uh, where everybody could hear him, mm. how that would have just added to it. It's almost like being on stage. Yeah. And we were a congregation. Having having lived by lakes a lot in BC, uh, your voice carries better over water. <laughs> it does. It's it does. It does. <laughs> it like does. It's a practical thing. Yeah. yeah. But the, the the calmness of it all. The setting itself may have been conducive to listening. Who knows? The crowd probably wouldn't. <laughs> okay, so I'll read it again, and uh, you know maybe something else sticks out because you. you the reason is kept reading because the thing is you, uh, 
to start losing track of the passage. We need to focus back on the word. Again, he began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. <clears throat> Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing, and yielding thirty and sixty and hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear, listen. Well, the word for me is still listen. Mm -hmm. And I think at different points in time, mm -hmm. it, it could be a quite a single day on any one of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Sometimes I hear the word God, I don't want to listen to that today. And sometimes I try to listen. And sometimes just the trials and tribulations of us that soak it up, choke it up. And uh, sorry, Lord, I don't want to listen to this today. I don't want to do this today. And more times it settles in, and I absorb it, and I try to live it. So there you go. It's a good personality. <laughs> but that's what came to me that time. Mm -hmm. I like to write, I like the idea of rain. Um, I've always had a bit of difficulty with. Uh, those who are quote unquote saved, that's the nice the nice seed that fell on soil, the nice soil. But the poor unfortunate seeds that for any for whatever reasons went off course or thorns got around them, the company they kept, or the they just weren't attentive to listening to the book to the, to the word of God. But then we're we're taught as God loves all. He he loved a repentant thief, but he also loved the thief that didn't repent. So I have a bit of feeling for those who struggle. Not so much the, as uh, we say, goody goodies who fall on the nice soil and grow up and everything's good. Even with them, I guess they got their troubles, but that's it. But I, 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 I think of the men and women in the world who, for whatever number of reasons, thorns or not inattentiveness or whatever it might have been, didn't, uh, didn't grab onto the word. So the rain comes down and helps them. And somewhere along the line, they, they find their way. And in uh, rereading the passage, uh, in a sense, the uh, 
what what happens is you come to understand the passage a little bit better. You know that it, like you say, uh, as Catherine and put it, you know, um, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, it's uh, the whole idea of uh, the listening and how that relates to to me, how this passage that Jesus is speaking to me. Uh, it's interesting because Jesus is talking to the crowds and you feel like when you read the passage, he's talking to you alone. Like, you know, as many people have said, it's as if you were talking to me. You know? And, and that's the point. That uh, the word is meant for each one of us in our particular circumstances. As we struggle with it, as we come to understand it, and as we may yet not fully understand it. Uh, one of the things about uh, reflecting with scripture, don't assume that you know what the word, uh, what the, uh, whatever. I, I think, for example, like the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. A lot of people, oh, that's all about, you know, you got to stop and help, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so, in a sense, you say, I I've heard that, you know, at Mass how many times in my life, you know, a hundred times. And uh, we think we know until we kind of sit with it and realize, wait a second, there's not a thing's going on. Who is the Good Samaritan? Ask yourself that question. Who is he? Who is the man who was left half dead? Who is he? Who are the people that are passing by? Who are they? And if you look at it from the different perspectives, the parable takes on new meaning. Who is the innkeeper? Who ultimately is given charge to look after the poor fella? <laughs> it's got a pretty, he's got a pretty big part to play, although you know we 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 hardly even think about it. And so uh parables especially have many different entrances and many different ways of looking at it. And uh, the word of God is best uh, approached with fresh eyes. And depending on your circumstance, it'll speak differently to you in the circumstance you find yourself in. Now, that's true of any scripture, but of parables especially. I always say be cautious with the parables. Just when you figured you, you thought you figured them out, they'll, uh, they'll reveal something else uh, to you when you realize that Wait a second. There's a uh, there's a multiple meanings uh, to these stories, and as scripture has a way of doing to us uh, with us. So uh, uh, that's in a nutshell. I uh, like I said, limited amount of time. So that's kind of a, a, a nutshell. How you do lectio lectio divina? Um, I would say uh, I uh, I'm a little closer to Ignatian, so I will now explain Ignatian. Prayer. Now, Ignatius was one of these people who had a very active imagination. Uh, as a young man, Ignatius wanted to become a knight, and he uh, actually had his dreams fulfilled, at least for a very short period of time. He was in the, the famous battle, uh, Pamplona. What, what was the town he was attacking? Anyway, he was, he was in this battle, and uh, uh, in the process, uh, he was he was in the thick of things, and he was doing what he wanted to do, and the cannonball hit his leg and shattered it into pieces. <laughs> that was the end of his military career. <laughs> but he was an active man. He saw himself. This is what he, you know, he dreamed of. He was a man who, in a sense, uh, had a great imagination. And in <laughs> fact, that is what he used in prayer, is his imagination. Okay. And so what he learned when he was convalescing in the hospital, and he was there for over a year, uh, 
because uh, you know his uh, leg was shattered and in those days you know you didn't really leave the hospital until you were fully recovered uh, you weren't sent home uh, and said you know whatever but uh, mm -hmm. so most of your time was spent in hospital during that time uh, you might say he was bored out of his mind and uh, he uh, he asked for uh, some literature uh, he wanted he was attracted to literature dealing mm -hmm. with knighthood and battles and all that kind of stuff and uh, for the most part, he got stuck with uh, the Bible and uh, the life of the saints. <laughs> so, um, and uh, during that time, he uh, he did a lot of reflecting and praying. And uh, during that time, he learned certain things. There was a man who, and from that experience, he came up with, um, I'm not sure if it was original, uh, but he is the one who wrote most extensively about and what basically he said uh, when it comes to scripture especially the gospels is if you want to encounter christ you must place yourself in the story okay very simple you must place yourself in the story okay so uh in order to illustrate that i picked another uh, oh i should keep my notes because i just want to refer to them more um the story of the healing of blind Bartimaeus, also in Mark's gospel. Okay, so um, I'm going to read the story once, and uh, you can put yourself in the place of anyone in the story. Okay, uh, sometimes it's pretty easy who you might choose. Sometimes, you know, the story has multiple characters. Sometimes you can associate with one or another. Sometimes you can associate even with the bad guy. For example, you know, we, we often look at the Pharisees as whatever, but so often we see ourselves as the Pharisees as well, okay? Because they weren't the bad guys. They were just simply some, sometimes people that um, uh, were stuck with a certain amount of, with a certain type of thinking and a certain way, a certain uh, way of looking at things. And they were unable to, as a result, or many were unable, or I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them were unable to truly see what was before their eyes, okay? So sometimes we can even relate, to, we can relate to the Pharisees, we can relate to anyone, okay? And, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a good association, okay? Okay, so uh, here's the passage. They came to Jericho, and as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Name the name the character. There are more than one here. Name the character who you felt most closely associated to. Now, depending on your situation, you know, and depending on how and what kind of condition you enter into this passage, what your circumstances are, it may be somewhat, you know, it may differ. But uh, who 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 did you feel uh, compelled to relate with in your case? Was, would, would be for me i think it would be uh some of the followers uh here's jesus you know noted 
noted notoriety in in the, in the area of the Jericho, and this man is calling out to him, and his buddies are they're, they're probably on their way somewhere, and someone sings out to him and says, "Look, leave leave the man alone. He's busy." Okay. Bartimaeus, yep. please be be good. Okay. So one of the not unknown people that were with him. Mm-hmm. Fair. It's fair. And uh, it's true. And and so often we 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 want to protect Jesus or we want to protect someone. And so mm-hmm. it's sort of like you know, yeah. give him a break or whatever. Yeah. That's fair enough. So you can kind of associate. You know, you you want to be the. In a sense, you feel that caretaking kind of, you know, that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else that you wanted to, that you can relate to in the passage? I'm definitely the blind man. The blind man? Persistent, oh, drives them crazy. I'm persistent, there's something that I want to do, something, you know, I'm going to get well in the teacher. Okay. You know, the point when anyone else says, if Jesus is passing by, I'm jumping up. Don't know to hello. Right? But then yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like like this was like for him. That probably meant if he could see he could bring a living again, provide for his family, maybe have a family. It was a lot of stake. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it was a lot of stake. Pretty determined. That's good. Hello, that's good. Yeah. Any uh anyone else want to contribute? There may be a different reason that you relate to any one of these characters too. I find myself being in the crowd too, telling him to be quiet. And I often in any of the reflections that I do, I tend to be that person because I think when you were talking about the Pharisees and that. One of my own fears is that I'm clung too much to the ideas that I have that I actually don't see Jesus for who he is because there's a rule, there's, you know, something you're supposed to do, there's a way it should be. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I see, oh, I'm saying, you know, be quiet, be quiet. But towards the end of it, I'm watching kind of in awe as how this person was brave and then stepped forward and kind of stepped out of law and then Mm -hmm. what had happened. He wasn't. You know, admonished for doing so, like, please yeah. come. Yeah, but Jesus actually holds him up in a sense. Yes. You know, I mean, everyone else tells him to be quiet, but it's Jesus that actually affirms that which he's doing. It's kind of interesting, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but it's true. I mean, uh, and uh, we could see how that is true uh, even in our church sometimes. You know, we tell people, well, no, no, that's not, you know, or no, no, that's not accepted here, or not, mm-hmm. or not whatever. And somehow, uh, you know, as if somehow we're, we're, we're shutting people down. And uh, sometimes those voices need to be heard. You know, so that can be seen in this passage. You see, I don't know if my character is even made, but I pictured myself just there as one of the crowds, just watching it all play out. Okay. She knows they were telling me to leave them alone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, not saying anything they wanted to say. You leave them alone. <laughs> and let him do. And I just, yeah. just watched out there and then be awestruck by what happened. Now, um, you know, um, following, uh, you know, if you, if you were to take the role of Bartimaeus, um, you know, we are, in a sense, uh, There's a if if we are to recognize it, we are the blind man, hoping to see again. You see, when we look at the world and we look at all the things, and it's sort of like God help me to see, because sometimes I just don't see it. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, you know. Um, uh, sometimes we're just sitting on the side of the road and it's sort of like, it seems like life is kind of dealt us a blow and uh, we can't see, you know, it seems kind of blurred or even sometimes hopeless. 
Sometimes we're frustrated, whatever it might be. And it's literally, we, 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 you know, there's this cry that goes out. And uh, what, I, what I like about Bartimaeus is that he's a blind man. And what does he do? He jumps up, he throws his beggar's cloak on the whatever, and he runs towards Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty dangerous. I mean, there's a crowd there. <laughs> you know, here's a man who, who, in a sense, throws caution to the wind. You know, uh, and uh, to have Jesus ask the question, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus doesn't assume what we want. You see, in prayer... And this is where, you know, the encounter happens, not just the desire to see Jesus, but this is where we're, we can, if we take Bartimaeus as our example, we don't have to. But we, too, are challenged with the same question. What do you want me to do for you? And Jesus doesn't assume, God does not assume to know the answer. What is it? Now, I want to divert you a bit. Just earlier on in Mark's gospel, he asked the same question of James and John. James and John came to Jesus just prior to this situation, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? They wanted seats on his right and on his left. <laughs> And Jesus, in a sense, kind of in a, kind of leads them through a teaching and whatever else. Okay, he asks the same question of Bartimaeus: What do you want me to do for you? The question comes quite often: What is it? What is it that we want Jesus to do for us? And Ignatius would say, "Yes, relate to the people, but relate, to, come to Jesus." with the issue that you're struggling with. What is it? Okay. Or in the crowds, you know, why, you know, uh, why am I having a hard time involving? Why am I kind of like the one, the one who perceives, you know, someone that's kind of, you know, is, is kind of first wants to see uh, there, there's less risk involved in it. The people that whatever is sort of like, you know, so why is it, you know, and, 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 and this is how we come. This is how we come, you know, we, we come as uh, whatever. So we can enter this passage differently, but all, all of us are encouraged to encounter Christ in his seat. Whoever's, whoever, whoever's point of view we take, we're, we're all in a sense, uh, in the end, uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 we're all led to, to, to Christ, you know, and so, you know, the man, uh, the man asks, and, 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 and so we need to answer the question with Barnabas, what is it you want me to do? What is it? And, uh, we may have different answers depending on where we are at in our lives. It's interesting that Jesus, uh, there is, there's a lot of interaction in this passage. That's why I choose it. I try to choose simple passages when I teach. Some passages are a little bit more difficult, uh, but then Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. In a sense, he sets him free. But what does the man do? He follows Jesus. He's told to go. And yet, he freely chooses to follow Jesus. Jesus sets him free. Go to him. Whatever <laughs> he chooses to follow Jesus, and the implication is because Jesus is heading to Jerusalem as he's leaving Jericho, is that he follows Jesus to the cross. He follows Jesus. 
Or is Jesus going? Going to Jerusalem. Okay, so um, so those are the two methods. Uh, and like I say, you can take any of these passages in many different directions. Okay, I try to point out the more obvious. and But like I say, uh, often it's, you know, you associate. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can even, for example, associate with Pilate. You know, when Jesus says, you know, uh, when Pilate says, what is truth? Sometimes we are that way. You can associate with his wording, what he chooses to say in a sort of like, it is quite legitimate. Okay. But let God then kind of, you know, help you through where you are at. Uh, because in a sense, it is a walk with him. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is much to for us to, to understand and there's much for us to reflect on. Okay. Uh, is that, I guess that's all I'm going to do with that, with those passages. Now, um, <clears throat> obviously I said, you know, um, you can reflect on any passage in the, in the, in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, some are easier, some are harder. Uh, sometimes the Old Testament, if they're not stories, they're probably easier to do Lectio Divina with it. Like, for example, you know, the whole idea of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you, when you when you have the image of the, the Lord, the, the Good Shepherd, uh, I'm uh, uh, Psalm twenty three. Uh, mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. You know, and uh, there may be particular. Uh, he leads me by living streams. He, you know, he he guides me. He, he uh, whatever you, you have these images, and so it's sort of like you can you. you a particular image, it becomes very easy. The Psalms are e relatively easy, some of them, to reflect on because mm -hmm. they have powerful images. And so do some of the uh, some of the pro prophetic pronouncements. Uh, but anyway, uh, and as I say, I kind of adapted. Sometimes I use kind of a combination of both, but it's to help you kind of enter into the passage. Um, uh, it's not so much that you... Uh, and, and to be able to kind of say, yeah, how does that intersect with my life? Now, um, St. Ignatius would also say that uh, one is to reflect on one's life, not just the scripture, but on one's life. And uh, he, had a, he had a method uh, that uh, he, uh, uh, he introduced and uh, is used by Jesuits. Uh, it's called the examine at the end of your day. Okay, so basically, at the end of your day, what you're encouraged to do, I try to do it each day, is to kind of sit back, take five minutes, it doesn't have to take terribly long, and uh, reflect back on the day and ask yourself, where did I see God? Or where was God trying to speak to me? Okay. So a good thing. Okay, so reflect on that. Where was it? Well, in my busy day, you know, and uh, some days might be easier than others. <laughs> in all that stuff, it's God. It may have been, you know, uh, someone saying something, say something to you. It may be that, you know, you were you were really on task and so as your Christian life was concerned at one point. Sort of like, yeah, where did I in? Where did I kind of intersect with God? Where did I meet him? Where, where in a sense was he, you know, where I said, yeah, I, I saw him. I saw a glimpse of him. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing has to do with where, in a sense, uh, you know, where did I fail to see him? And, and often that's in, in, the, in, the, in the moments of, uh, you know, where you messed up. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all have those moments. And Ignatius says both have to be caught straight on. You can't just focus on the negative. You can't just focus on whatever. And the negative isn't necessarily to dwell on the negative, but to basically say, you know what? Where is it? Where in a sense I could sort of say, yeah, you know, I... Uh, and, 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 that, and there it really is a turn to God's mercy. You know, where the first one is thank you, and the other one is God's mercy. 
that you may be hopefully equally thankful for, or if not more so. So to reflect that and to what I think, and then to, in a sense, ask for that which you need the next day. And it's often in reflection to the first two. You know? So in a sense, you put yourself to rest. And you rest your day in God, okay? By being a reflective person. So you're meditating essentially on your life, on your, and, and when done, on your day. Okay, so, uh, 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 and uh, it does not have to be long. It's not a matter of, sometimes you may lengthen it simply because you want to sit with something. Okay, and in this way, by doing this, your life becomes naturally more reflective, meaning that if you take the time to, you know, to take some time each day to reflect on scripture or on a regular basis, and you take each time each day to kind of look back and whatever, you can become more attuned to where God is moving you. Where is he acting? What is he doing? Uh, so does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and at the end of uh, St. Ignatius, uh, you know, uh, is, is, you know, for, so the first thing is gratitude for where you saw him. The next is mercy. And the last is, you know, in a sense of a resolution to follow it, meaning it's sort of like, yeah, and I renew myself as I go to bed. I renew myself that I will follow. Okay. So then in a sense, you're, you're, you're strengthening yourself. It's not an exercise to find yourself. Okay? That is not prayer, beating yourself up. That's what the devil wants you to do. Beat yourself up. Okay? God wants you to learn both from the good and from the not so good. You might even say the bad. Okay? Uh, Socrates once said, and it was Socrates who said it, the unexamined life is not worth a day. That's why I think prayer should be part of everyone's life. And if prayer is not a part of life, uh, you're missing something. Simply. Uh, you know, it's not a judgment, just simply you're missing something. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that it, it, it is good to just spend time in prayer. Uh, and to uh, <laughs> more black to, to recognize him. Some will say you can, you know, you you could spend time reflecting on God and nature, uh, and uh, or even by looking at history. That's why I say the lives of the saints can be fruitful material. Some people are very inspired when they read a life of the saints, saying, "Oh yes, look at they." Uh, and with a saint, it wasn't that they're perfect, but because they. Uh, they, 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 they faced certain obstacles and they did so heroic. So, uh, uh, and so to reflect on that and to draw strength from that, not just compare yourself, but to draw strength from it. I realize it's now 10 to 8, so uh, <laughs> being very respectful of whatever. I don't know, we didn't have time for questions. I don't know if there was a question or two. Or... It was fast 50 minutes. I think. We used to do it, let's do it. We did, yeah. yeah. We used to do it on a week, was it Sundays or Mondays? Monday, Monday. Monday. We used to do it on Mondays so that oh, then you could be reflecting for the week. And I remember oh. one person used to say, I really look forward now to what the priest has got to say on Sunday. Oh, and it's usually on the Sunday right into your dog. You yes. reflect on Sunday meeting? Yeah. To see if you got out of it when I got out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, um, and, you know, I used to have a reflection group uh, when I was in uh, Cologne and the Pius X, uh, and it was always uh, with the uh, Carol on Mondays, and they really loved it. They were, they were really cool. Yeah. 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 Do we have to be aware of prayer to pray? That's kind of a strange kind of a little query there, but 
um, and I try to in the morning, at least every morning when I wake, to say a morning offering. And as I offer all my thoughts, words, actions, joys, sorrows, whatever I have in my, my everyone does it, I'm sure, throughout the day. And then from time to time in the day, I'm anything but God minded, but I'm, I'm trying and struggling with something or another. It could be something physical in the, in the world fixing up something and trying to put it up on the wall or something or or some relationship or some someone on the phone getting on my nerves or whatever the case might be do i have to be aware of prayer to pray when i you know i try to offer it in the morning more more often than not like for example i i, I think back on my life okay and i think of my teenage years where at times i would just lie on my bed when i came back from school and just try to figure things out. I would say that I was praying because it was in the context of my faith, even though it wasn't always talking to God, but it was always trying to make sense of and trying to see where indeed all this fit together. I think that, um, uh, and considering my overall disposition, I would say that some of that, maybe not all of it, but some of that could be considered prayer. Sometimes we're unaware even, and especially if as Catholics or as Christians, I guess, or as really any person of faith, uh, we have a strong sense of God because even in our imagination, as we're daydreaming, even in the scenarios we daydream about, God figures itself in. You know, that we're, uh, in my mind, I'm never removed from God because, in a sense, the, 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 the moral questions, the questions of what is right, what is wrong, how I see myself, I like to see myself as the saint, although I'm not always, I'm definitely not um, always in reality a saint, uh, but in a sense uh, that we visualize ourselves. And in, in, in many respects, we could say that we are. You know that there is an element of prayer. You know uh, uh, now uh, I don't necessarily then want to say that uh, you know well I, I I don't have to then sit down to <laughs> that's right. Right. right all the time. Yeah. That's right. And I do think every person, in one way or another, is being called into uh, a greater sense of prayer uh, as they progress in the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. You know. If it's just simply, you know, being more meditative, more conscious of what they're doing, uh, more readily calling on God in particular circumstances, more readily, in a sense, uh, uh, trying to live each moment according to the will of God, meaning that, you know, even though we slip, there is that desire, and even that going back when we slip, that we, we see it in the context of our faith. So... Um, you know, uh, there's many ways where we're, we're connecting with faith and connecting that, 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 that there is a, an element of prayer there. You know, it's a dialogue and it's a struggle. And uh, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a growing into. And it's, it's, it's a relationship that uh, has many dimensions to it. That touches all aspects of our life. But there needs to be that openness, I think. I think that's the big thing with prayer is that openness uh, to God and uh, uh, to seeing our life in, in that context. Thank you. Thank you very much.